Hello everyone. Thank you for being here. Let's get this going. So I realize it's the only slide with a picture of the speaker, but alas. So I'm Mikna Stoika. I'm a character TD with side effects. And on screen is my very sort of short and brief history in the, the CG field. I started in 2016 at Verde University of Applied Sciences. Then end of that, 2019, I joined side effects labs in LA for an internship. And after that, I joined the character team R&D, where I've been working with KinFX uh, ever since. So this presentation is going to be about ragdolls. So Warren showed, uh, just in the previous one, some ragdoll results that he's got. And he also showed dynamic motion and how he set up dynamic motion. Of course, over ragdoll, he kind of skipped a bit because ragdoll is a bit more complicated to set up than dynamic motion because it involves all the body parts. So that's why we sort of split things up. So in this one, we're going to have a look at uh, his scene again. But this time, we're going to dive into actually what goes into setting up Ragdoll for this particular scene, and not so much about what he did, because he obviously already talked about that. So to reiterate uh, what, what's the Ragdoll component in this scene, here's again the scene with no Ragdoll, where he just uh, Warren just uh, hand keyed some, some bits on the, the white character. And then as we apply the actual Ragdoll onto the same character, we see some uh, collisions going on, and then the actual throw off with the character colliding with the chair. So that's the actual like, ragdoll section, and that's what we're going to be looking at today. So let's start with the data, because we have this scene of like three characters, like two characters basically in a chair, which is essentially three. But what exactly, how, how exactly does this look like, and what can we do with it to, to configure it for ragdoll? So here's the Houdini interface. I'm going to go uh, window by window, so it's very clear. We have here on the left um, a file sub. So our scene has been configured and then exported as a PGO file. It's a bunch of packed primitives. I'm going to touch on that in just a second. We basically want to bring in our scene because it's already been, been set up for us by somebody. And we want to use the same data uh, to configure our ragdolls. This currently has no animation, and that's fine because we don't need that for the ragdoll. While Warren works on the hand key animation or blocks out his, uh, his shot, we can actually start configuring stuff already. This is how the data looks in the viewport, which perhaps doesn't tell you that much. We have one character, presumably, a chair, and a bunch of white lines, which we're not going to talk about. They are the apex graphs. Rig tree. Then this is where the actual data gets listed nicely for us, OK? Because you know, if you go back to this, where the ugly white lines doesn't help us very much. But when we look at the actual structure of the data, it's a lot easier for us to see exactly what we're working with. So we're looking by the indents there. Let me bring this up a bit higher on screen. We see we've got three dot char stuff, which Esther talked about before as being characters. Under each of these dot char, we have a base rig, shape, and scale. The base is just the random default name, so it doesn't have to be that. The extensions outline what that data is. So we see our chair is an actual character, and we've got a push E and a push R. So the push E being the white character, the push R being the uh, brown character. And what we're interested in for each character is our rig. So an apex graph, a shape, so the skin, right? Your classic skin that you sort of uh, weight your skeleton to, and a skeleton which, you know, if you know KinFX a little bit, is basically a KinFX skeleton, right? So we've built the characters like this. This is what we have to work with. So then we can have a look at uh, using this data to get the ragdoll stuff going. If you're not familiar with ragdoll, uh, I'm going to try in like five seconds to explain what ragdoll needs. So it uses an RBD solver, so rigid by, uh, body dynamics solver which means it looks for rigid bodies, obviously. Uh, a character usually is organic, right? So you're going to have some skin that's being deformed by some joints uh, that have been weighted to that skin. So that's usually not, it's not easy to separate that into clear segments and sort of cut the skin just from that data. So we need an extra step inserted in there that would allow us to create these rigid body shapes for our character that then we can send to the solver so it can then um, simulate on top of. And for that, we have a SOP called Ragdoll Collision Shapes. So this SOP has existed in the 19.5 as well. But we've sort of reworked it a bit and made it hopefully uh, easier to use and faster. You can see on screen the parameter interface. Um, we're not going to be looking at that too much. But I just want to point out that I really like it because it's clean and it doesn't have a lot of things like it used to. We try and keep it as narrow as possible. And we only want to sort of link up some of the things that we need in terms of data in the network view. And then we want to move on from that and work in the viewport. Uh, so that's just defaults. In terms of inputs, we have here uh, two unpack folders. So one is pusher scale, one is pusher skin. We're going to be setting up the pusher character, so the brown one for this example. But the process is the same for all. The unpack folder, in this case, looks at our file. 
so at the, the file sop, which is the scene, and extracts a particular data from a particular path. Okay? So you can think as the data as basically my pusher.char is a packed primitive. Underneath pusher.char, we have three other packed primitives that sort of been packed within. So we have a skeleton that's packed, a skin that's packed, and a rig that's packed. Okay? Unpack folder, we look at pusher.char, so it looks at that pusher.char packed primitive, then dives inside that primitive and looks at base.scale primitive, gets that for us, and unpacks the result. And this gives us the actual skeleton as a geometry object that you know, we're used to from KinFX and all the like. And the same for the skin. So we're doing, doing the same thing. You can see the, the path over there, except this time we're extracting the dot shape, not the dot scale. And I'm getting the skeleton and the shape here because ragdoll collision shapes works best with uh, these two inputs. Then we can get rid of all of that and go straight to the state. And this is what we're getting. So the node uses the skin and the skeleton to figure out what parts have been uh, weighted to each of the joint and then builds some convex holes from that. And then it gives us some nice abilities to manipulate those shapes in the state. So here you can see I'm merging some shapes with their parents. So I don't want finger, like a shape for each uh, finger. So I'm just going to collapse those into one shape that is uh, connected to the hand itself. And we also have options for showing stuff like intersections. So you know things that could potentially create problems in the solve later on that we can address uh, ahead of time. So the red thing there shows us where two shapes uh, are intersecting, which again could cause some issues. So I can go in, I can transform a shape, I can change shape, I can remove a shape, you know, all those sort of basic operations that you would expect when working with uh, geometry. So each of these shapes represents a packed a primitive as well. And as you can see, you know, it has separated our character or our skin rather really well into very clear parts, right? So you can see they're all colored differently. So it becomes very clear, you know, what's my upper arm, what's my lower arm, what's my hand, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And this is what the solver likes to see when attempting to simulate something. Next up. So this was sort of the, the first step. Now back to the five second ragdoll crash course. Once we've got the collision shape set up, then we, we can give those to the solvers, of course, to the solver, which will take it as a whole and just make it sort of fall to the ground as like a statue sort of thing. But because we're working with characters, we also want to make sure that we tell the solver what the range of motion is for each of the shapes, right? Because the ragdoll, as we've seen also in, in Cameron's video, um, you know, it's supposed to basically be a ragdoll, like fall down and have the, of each of the, the shapes like rotate uh, around their parents to create the sensation of motion. So that's an extra data that we need to configure. So now we have the shapes. So we can go to the next step, which is basically for each shape, i.e. joint, because they're sort of correlated, um, we want to set that range of motion. And for that, we have a configured joint limits SOP. So we used to have configured joints, we still do, that had limits. Uh, as well as some other stuff for the physical full body IK, like weights and local center of mass, we've decided to split off into a configured joint limits. That's a specialized node for dealing only with rotation and translation limits, mainly to again keep the parameter interface a bit more narrow and cleaner, and also to allow us to do some more interactive work that are tailored specifically for limits. In terms of wiring it up, we just basically plug the first input of our ragdoll collision shapes into the first, the first output, or into the first input which is the skeleton, and that's what we're going to be operating on. We're going to be setting some attributes on the skeleton via this node. Now, something to point out here is that for ragdoll collision shapes, we were able to get the skin and use that as our starting point for the shapes, right? Because going in and, you know, for each joint, trying to create a new shape by hand is tedious. So the solution for the shapes is using the skin and getting the, the capture data from that to build the shapes. For the limits, however, we, don't, we can't use the skin, obviously. So as an alternative, what we decided to do was to provide a motion clip input, which if you know, you know roughly what a motion clip is, a bunch of poses over, a, like a bunch of packed poses basically over timeline. So it represents an animation that's been stashed out, right? So it's no longer time dependent. And that means that we can have like, you know, an X amount of poses uh, stored as a, as a stashed geometry, which each pose, you know, having a, a different range of motion for each of the joints, right? Because it's that's basically an animation. So that's a great way to get some defaults for our limits. But of course, you know, where do you get the motion clip from? So if you're lucky enough to have like a calisthenics clip or something like that in-house where you can retarget your calisthenics clip to your character's skeleton, that's great. You could use that. 
If not, we, if not, we've decided to include an example file. So you can go under the help card of the configure joint limits up. And then we have a, um, an HDA which you can load into your scene. And this one has within it a few things, including a stashed motion clip that Warren helped us uh, animate. So it represents a sort of a basic range of motion for a particular character, like a bipad. So you could just use that as a starting point. We also show some tips how to pose your character and get the range of motion uh, configured by yourself. So that's what I did here. I just loaded that file and I copied that stash from within that file and pasted it here, which is the motion clip. So in my case, I'm lucky because we've configured the motion clip on the same mannequin character. But in case you have a different character, which you probably will, uh, we also have a very simple retargeting network included in an example file. So you could just use that in order to get the motion clip sort of transferred over to your own skeleton. And this is how the, the, that motion clip looks like. That's basically the ranges of motion that uh, Warren configured for us. Right? It's just a bunch of poses. There's no interpolation. We don't care about that. We just care about the actual poses themselves to get the values out of those. So once that's done, back to the viewport. So for limits, there's not a lot that we can do right now because you know a limit looks like this. Um, which is, you know, not really very clear as to if it's good or not. For stuff like elbows and knees, it's, it's a bit easier to figure out because, you know, we know roughly how a knee or a, an elbow is supposed to rotate, so we can just sort of check that the motion clip did uh, something we would expect for those areas. But for all the rest, you know, as long as there is something there and looks uh, reasonable, we are good to go for now. We can return back to this step a bit later once we have some motion so we can actually test against that. That's what I said about not making a lot of sense. OK, so these are the two data parts that we need to get the ragdoll started. Um, I want to also point out here really quickly that the, we still have the ragdoll in SOPS, so what we have used to have in 19.5 for KinFX. Uh, we also have this now new ragdoll tool for the packed character format. They are both were great, they both are much faster, so we still have the Ragdoll Solver that works with the same nodes that I just shown here. But for this example, I'm going to stick with the packed character format because it's sort of the, new, the newest thing. So once we've got stuff configured, I want to put it back into our scene, and to do that, we use a pack folder. <clears throat> so basically, the, the principle is the same. It's kind of a brother or a cousin or whatever of the unpack folder, where I plug my scene into the first input of the node, and you can see up there, parent folder, here, we've got pusher.char, right? So I'm looking again, I'm telling the node, please get that pusher character, get that packed primitive for me, because that's the one that I want to add stuff to. And then there, we've got that multiparm, which basically is connected to these inputs down here. So it's one multiparm entry per one input it's in the same order, right? So you see the first one as being our skeleton, the second one being as the collision shapes. And for the skeleton, we know it's called base.scale, and I want to match the name here because I want to overwrite my skeleton. I haven't actually modified it, just added an attribute for the limit, so I'm happy to overwrite what was already there. If you don't want to, you can have a different skeleton to use just for ragdoll, but in this case, it was unnecessary. And then for the shapes, I just named them ragdoll collision and didn't really give them an extension. Uh, you can, if it helps your workflow, you can do a dot shape or something similar. It doesn't really matter. <coughs> Afterwards, we can do our first test. So I have a, a scene animate dropped down here, which, as we've been shown before, is the place where you want to sort of animate, and you know you can add things to your character, which you know might get stored out like the ragdoll. Um, so it's a good place to do the first test because, of course, we can save our configurations for later use. And then we go into the the apex animate state. I go straight to ragdoll because that's what we're working on today, and you can see there's nothing here yet, just the ground plane. And then I press H to add a new ragdoll character. And now you're going to be sort of swarmed with a bunch of prompts, which might look very confusing. But I'm going to explain them uh, in just a second. I'm not going to try and match the speed of this. Just look at how many there are and think, oh my god. This one is pretty, probably the only one that's clear. OK, great. So what just happened? We don't want to get any, um, we don't want to make any assumptions, basically. I think it's sort of the, 
this, this summary here. So when you create a new ragdoll character, you have the data in your scene, right? But the ragdoll itself doesn't exist. So we need to tell the ragdoll tool what sort of pieces of data, where to look for rather, the pieces of data that it needs in order to build what we expect to see. So in those prompts, let's just play this back again because now maybe it makes a bit more sense. So in those prompts, we can see that the first one gets uh, is something like in, in the lines of selecting the skeleton. So select source skeleton. So we go to the pusher, which is our brown character, and we get, get that skeleton of that character. Good. Then tell me where the collision shapes are. We just added them, so they're under pusher because we just did that. We select those. Then channel prims. Press accept to create new. I'm going to touch this in a second. We don't have any uh, yet, so I'm going to click accept, and both for the motion clip. Then we name our ragdoll that's going to be in the scene. And then because we didn't specify a motion clip, the tool wants to build its own. So here we go through the more complicated bit of selecting where to build it from. Um, So build motion clip. This one is probably the most difficult one to understand. Um, if you paid attention to the previous talks, you've seen that we no longer store the actual animation on the skeleton like we did in KineFX. Right? So in KineFX, you had a skeleton. You were animating the skeleton, and then the points would transform and you know, uh, over time based on cert set keys. We no longer do that in uh, the packed character format, but rather we, st we store the animation on some things called channel primitives, which I'm going to explain in a second as well, um, which then drive the actual rig, right? So imagine a control of a hand, which has like a vector, like a translate vector exposed to the, to the apex graph, right? The rig. You move that control around, and that's a simple translation, and that's our animation in this case. And then inside the same rig, you know, there's basically a bunch of things you can also do. But one of the things that we also do very often is we also expose the skeleton itself and the skin so we can see the output. So imagine the layers being like this. We get a skeleton, which is at rest pose, right? So just sort of the eight pose. We, we give it to the rig and say, this is the skeleton. We get the skin, again, at rest pose and with the capture weights. We give it to the rig and say, this is my skin. Then we have a bunch of controls with either vectors exposed, like I just mentioned. Then we do our animation and whatever. And then at the end, once our uh, rig has evaluated and we have all the updated transforms of the controls, we have the option of writing the, those transforms back to the skeleton. So we now sort of circle back and go to that KineFX picture where our skeleton starts to move. We don't store it there, that's very important, but we can get the output of that. So we can get the skeleton moving out of a rig. In certain cases, also the skin that's actually been bone deformed as well. But for the motion clip build step in particular, we care about that skeleton path. Because a motion clip, again, it's a bunch of poses over, you know, that's been stashed with the time attribute to define, to determine uh, where should they play. Um, so we need a skeleton with some animation on it, right? Because we want to basically give our ragdoll. That's the whole purpose, which you probably should have started with. Uh, we want to have the ragdoll match the animation of our character, right? That's the whole purpose of this. Because as Warren shown in the, the throw off scene, we want ragdoll to inherit that throw off and then have the simulation take over. So we need to figure out how can we build that motion clip out of the, the, the components we've got. And the way to do it is we look at, let's find the rig that we're supposed, that holds our animation, that is supposed to evaluate and give us the resulting animation, which in this case would be push for that character, because that's the one we're configuring, based on the rig, right? That's our rig. Then we say, we know we have the rig. We care specifically about the updated skeleton output of that rig. Right? So we want to write out the transforms of the controls onto that skeleton and get that output from there. So we go output node, that's just the name of the output node. It can be anything, you know, my node or whatever, and base that scale. So this is kind of something you have to have in the rigs for Ragdoll specifically, because Ragdoll works on a skeleton. So it expects a skeleton both at rest pose, which we selected at first and both as the uh, actual animated output of the rig. And once we've sort of gi given the ragdoll the path to that skeleton, it can finally figure out what to do with it and build a motion clip under the hood for us so the ragdoll can inherit the motion. Um, and then let's move on. And basically, we are getting <coughs> the, a default ragdoll. So we have a character that sort of just flaps to the ground with the limits we've configured and the shapes we've configured. 
I can toggle it to the side a bit so we can see them side by side. Obviously, there's no motion here for now, but having that path of the motion clip saved will help us later on because we can very easily rebuild it. Um, and yeah. Uh, next up here, I wanted to also play with some options just to make sure you know things look sensible with the, the limits and shapes and whatnot. We still have no animation yet, so I'm just going to sort of start from rest pose and try some things. So one of the bits that also are needed in Ractal, um, especially with working with rigs like IK or stuff that's not just pure FK, we need to tell the tool what shape corresponds to what control in order to know when Warren was showing the, the baking of the poses, right? It needs to know like what transform to bake basically from which shape to which control. Because we can't really match it by name in this case, because you know, your IK can be named anything. That's what I mentioned FK would work, because usually that's, you know, if you keep the FK names the same as the joints, it's a bit easier since the shapes are named as the joints. But in case of an IK or a more complicated rig where you've got, you know, God knows what names then uh, you have to create this mapping step in between, which again, you only have to do once. It's going to get stored on the character itself, and um, you can reuse it later on. And now we're going to do the, some configurations here. So here's the windows that weren't shown. I'm going to touch on those in a second as well. And here I just wanted a very basic um, pose where I just rotated the source character from the root control and I position it a bit higher up. Just wanted to test how the limits behave when the character lies sort of horizontally. So I'm going key there, just to keep the pose. And then we go over to our ragdoll character. We do reload target animation, and we tell the tool for which ragdoll character we want to reload it, in this case, the push or motion clip. Because we've already set the path to the motion clip, uh, it knows where to look for. And this updates our ragdoll motion. So this is all you update the motion when you want. So it doesn't update automatically, which means you can go back and forth between a particular clip any times you want without sort of updating the ragdoll without you wanting to. And then I'm also setting some match world transforms constraints there, just so we can see how the limits behave when the character sort of keeps the pelvis in place. So it matches the source character pelvis position, but everything else just flaps uh, with pure ragdoll. And then at the end, we also want to test the poses. I'm here doing a, a dense baking just to see if there are any issues with our mapping. Maybe we did some, some mistakes or maybe there's something wrong, but this seems to be fine. So once you know, we sort of did the initial tests, um, we can now uh, ask Warren what, how, how's the blockout going. So we can actually test on that as well before sending him uh, the file so he can actually take it away and configure to his um, own liking. Uh, here are the options for Ragdoll. So these are, you know, obviously I'm not going to explain each of them because that's not really useful. You can check on those if you're interested in the docs. The point is we've got options for like sort of constant, we call them. So basically like physical options for the shapes like density, bounce and friction. So that's also something we will probably be configuring at this step. You know, if you have some shape that's really big compared to the rest and it sort of seems to be driving the Ragdoll in a direction that you don't really want to, we can lower the density of that shape and we can sort of adjust it per shape. Then we've got animated stuff like adding constraints for wall transforms and local transforms, uh, making a character inactive or a shape inactive. This is all stuff that Warren's going to probably play with when he actually does the shot, but we can still make sure everything behaves correctly for our uh, current configurations. And then some stuff for the ground plane here, which are pretty self-explanatory, I hope. Then we finally get the, the block out from uh, Warren, and we can test that as well really quickly before sending him the, the result. So here's again the same network. Nothing really changed, except we just reloaded our file swap up there, and now we've got some new data in it, um, which are the, the, the actual animation as channel primitives. So let me touch on that really, really briefly here, because I think channel primitives are a new concept in H20. So imagine a channel primitive being the what a motion clip is to an animation, basically. So we take the uh, animation curves that you see, and we put those into packed primitives that we call you know, channel primitives, and we store the keys basically on there. So it no longer plays by the timeline, it's no longer time dependent, uh, but it's rather stored as a sort of a stashed static bit. So again, basically like a motion clip for our channel curves. And that's how we store animation now in this packed character format. That's what we get in that file swap now. 
And we don't see anything, of course, in the viewport because we're not really evaluating our scene yet. But if we go to, no, oh, um, yeah, that's it. Uh, debug limits. So actually, this is a sort of an in-between point here. Before we go straight to Ragdoll and test the scene, um, this is where the, the configure join limit state becomes a bit more useful. Because again, before, you know, when you have a character at rest pose that you build some limits for, it's, you know, it, they either look very off or they look pretty good. You're not really sure exactly what, where the problems might occur unless, until you get the actual clip where you can sort of test against. And the first test that I sort of recommend you try and do is you get the, um, an invocation of the scene. So if you're a bit unsure what this means, is we're basically saying, I want the push, the push E in this case. So it's the white uh, skeleton of the white character. Um, it doesn't really matter. We say, I want a skeleton from my scene. Please use all the stuff that's in the scene, including the animation, including you know, everything that's been configured there, and give me that particular output of our rig. And this is basically th what the state does when we animate. It's just that allows us to more granularly select bits of that scene to evaluate. In this case, we're getting Wern's animation uh, written out to the skeleton. Then we do a rig stash pose to set some rest transforms, because this is still KinFX and we still rely on these attributes when working with stuff in subs. Then we go to configure joint limits. And you can see already on screen the result on the configure joint limits sub with a bunch of red joints. So the same way the gradual collision shapes has a display intersections option that shows you some pot potential uh, areas that could create issues, we have the similar concept for configure joint limits that shows you which of my current joints are outside of their limits already. Because remember, when we configure the limits, we configure them from a motion clip that has nothing to do with the motion itself, right? And then maybe our animator, if those limits haven't been built into the rig as well, maybe he'll just go and pose the character and take the, some joints outside their allowed limits uh, from the get-go. And you know, the solver might struggle a bit with this. Uh, it could probably work, but you know, it's probably less stable. So a good practice here is to test that your pose, especially at least the first pose that sort of goes into Ragdoll, because right? once the Ragdoll takes over, um, it's going to handle this for us. But at least the first animated pose that we want to send to Ragdoll, we can check there to make sure that we don't have any important joints like wildly outside their limits. And if we, if we do, we can now go to the state and tweak those just slightly in order to bring them back to where they should be. By bring them back, I mean the limits, not the animation, because I don't want to be messing with Warren's stuff. So here I'm getting the handle, right? That represents the sort of the spherical range of motion of the, the particular joint on three axes. And you can see we've got that white line there, not now, in a second. That white line there, which represents the current rotation. And then I just move the range a little bit more. So it uh, keeps, it basically holds that, uh, that rotation as well. And I just get, get rid of the root because it's annoying and doesn't, doesn't have a shape, so it doesn't really matter anyway. Once we've done this as well, now we're sure that at least this pose in particular has no intersections for the shapes and has no limits, no joints outside their limits, except the fingers, which we know we already um, collapsed as collision shape-wise into the hand, right? So we don't really have shapes for those, so again, it doesn't matter. If we had shapes for them, we want to be addressing those joints as well. And then finally, we can test our actual scene again in the state. So we see we've got the three characters with the animation that weren't showed. In, now this includes the chair. And I just went ahead and configured the ragdoll for all characters. So the, the, the steps are exactly the same. It's just that now the motion clips get built um, from the animation rather than the rest pose. So we see them um, fall onto each other. And um, the only thing that I'm doing here as well is just setting this character as inactive because we know the only direction we've got from Warren was basically that character is not going to do anything, just as, act as a collider. So I'm just putting that as a inactive. So just follow the animation, but still be a collision. And then everything else, of course, you know, now you go more tests, make sure that the white character is fine. We can key some attributes, you know, get that world transform on and off. So get the throw off, test the chair. Once we're happy and things look good, this goes over to Warren and then he does what he's shown like half an hour ago. And this is again the result of that scene. So we can see exactly what Warren did with what we've configured. And then of course that little bit at the end is an extra animation uh, on top of the ragdoll. Thank you.
Are there any questions? Hi. Sure. What do you mean configured as characters? Yeah. Um, there we go. Okay. Um, like they're all coming packed as, uh, what's the name of character? Oh, the pack folder? Yeah, pack yeah. folder. Um, for any kind of like uh, colliders that we want to have, is there any way to bring them in for the Oracle system or do they need to be packed like that? So you can, Again, like the, the step of getting the shapes, right, was that sort of fractal collision shapes, and then we add them, all of them, under the character. So to get them in the animate state, to work with them in the ragdoll tool, they need to be on, you know, in the packed format, because that's what the tool looks for. But in terms of how you bring them to that packed format, it's really up to you. You can use the ragdoll collision shapes, you can, you know, hand model, you can even sculpt, I guess, your shapes. And then as long as they have a name, it's the only thing that they need, I believe. Um, you can do you just put them in the pack folder, right? That that's all there is to it. If you're working with the pack character format, if not, Ragdoll Solver expects them as just geometry as an input. So no. Thanks. Anybody else? Thanks, Mignia. Thank you.